Okay, when we have a cloud chamber, try to understand we are having dry ice, which is actually solid carbon dioxide, right? Solid carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide, okay, will undergo sublimation and form a lot of vapor of carbon dioxide here, all right? And we are having alcohol. Alcohol also go to vaporization. We get a lot of alcohol vapor here. And the carbon dioxide will bring down the temperature in this area. So the sponge is to make sure that the carbon dioxide have a very intact contact with the black metal surface. This is the black metal surface, all right? The black metal surface is used to give a contrast of color when we observe from up. When we observe from up, we get a contrast color, contrast color. So now, as we know, when we place a radio isotope, when we place a radio isotope, all right, here, this radio isotope, when we place a radio isotope here, okay, as we place a radio isotope here, we realize if the tracks are very thick, all right, it's a white color track, huh? I'm drawing a black color, it's a white color track. If it's very thick like this, confirm alpha was emitted. If it's a wavy track like this, confirm beta was emitted. And hardly can see which it's gamma ray, okay? Let's look at a YouTube view, huh? see, huh? it will give you a bigger picture of what's happening, okay? This is cloud chamber, okay? Cloud chamber, okay, cloud chamber. Okay, see here, uh, uh, see here this one. See guys, see ya. This americium 241. Hope, can you see the thick tracks? The thick tracks shows the appearance of alpha. See, home like that. Uh, so earlier when you see nothing, like, like nothing inside there, right? The black metal surface at the bottom, but now you can see the thick track. This is the track. This is how we use a cloud chamber to identify, all right, to identify the type of emission. So when you use cloud chamber, we want to identify the type of emission. So see here, so we have radioisotopes, all right? And based on the observation, we'll identify what was emitted. What was emitted, okay? Look at here, another example. Okay. If let's say now, okay, see here, we have the cloud chamber. Okay, this is the cloud chamber. Okay, we have cloud chamber. Okay, now. In the first one, if you see, let's say we place the, it has stuck inside. Okay. Let's say you saw here, all right, very thick track. All right, you're able to see thick, straight tracks, very thick one. And also you are able to see a small wavy tracks, right? And it's a bit longer. So now you can tell, oh, that shows that this system is emitting, it is emitting alpha and beta. Alpha and beta, example one. Now let's say we have example two. Example two, you place the radio isotope inside here. Then when you observe from the Mika window on top of the cloud chamber, you realize that you get a very tiny wave. Not clear also, right? And you get a bit thicker uh, curve like this. So now you can tell, confirm this radio isotope, this radio isotope, let's say called radio isotope X, it is emitting beta particle and emitting gamma ray, gamma ray. So by observation, we know, all right? And the last example, the last example, let's say this is the radio isotope and we call it, let's say, radio isotope Q, all right? When we observe, we realize that we have 
tick tracks like this. Very tick tracks. You can get the tick, tick, tick tracks, huh? okay? And at the same time, we get very small, tiny wave. Can't see also, all right? A bit wavy like that. So now you can tell clearly Q was emitting gamma ray and alpha. Any question, anyone? Yourself, do you understand? Understood. Honey, can you understand? Yes, teacher. Thank you. Okay, next. We are done with this part. Okay. Did I teach your group Half-Life or not? Not yet. No, not yet. Eh? Okay, so now, first we looked at cloud chamber. The second device to concentrate is dosimeter. Okay, dosimeter got few types of dosimeter. Some of the dosimeters are used to detect strength or strength of sound, loudness of sound. Eh? Okay. Some are used to detect strength of sound or loudness of sound. So it's, it's a different one. The dosimeter I'm showing here is the dosimeter to detect radiation. Radiation. So you check this kind of dosimeter. It's a very simple device, but handphone size only. So this device also can be used to detect radiation. Mainly it can detect gamma radiation. Gamma radiation. So by the dosage that it is detecting, we will know are we exposed to a higher or lower strength of radiation. So we have cloud chamber, now dosimeter. Okay, next we're going to look at Geiger Muller tube. Okay, remember guys, Geiger Muller tube. Okay, it is made of two components. The first component, it's the aluminum cylinder. This is the aluminum cylinder. All right, this is the aluminum cylinder. All right, the second one it's called the rate meter. The rate meter, the second one is called the rate meter. Okay, so by using aluminum cylinder and then it's connected like, through a wire. Okay, how Geiger Muller tube will work? Remember, cloud chamber just now is only able to detect type of radiation. What are the type of radiation? Geiger Muller tube can give us the accurate reading, the accurate reading of radiation emitted. It can be counted in count per minute or count per second, or the actual way of counting is Soviet or Bacterial count. Soviet or Bacterial count. Okay, let's look at the diagram of a Geiger Muller tube. Okay. Basically, most of the time we will identify Geiger Muller tube is only able to detect gamma, a bit of beta, jarang, eh, jarang, alpha, alpha susah sikit. The reason is because you see the mica window here, uh, alpha a bit difficult to enter because alpha can be even blocked by cardboard. But if you remember our previous lesson, I told you all, some radioisotope might be emitting a very strong radiation. A strong radiation shows that it might be high amount of radiation of alpha and then maybe a bit of alpha can enter. Okay, let's see here carefully. First thing to understand, alpha, if alpha enter, alpha is positively charged, positively charged. Beta, it is negatively charged. Gamma is neutral, but it comes with a very high frequency. Okay, look at the buildup of the Geiger Muller tube. Look at the buildup of the Geiger Muller tube. See carefully, the cylinder is made of aluminium. Aluminium cylinder. So this is the aluminium tube. And disconnected to the negative terminal. So this whole thing is actually cathode. Negative terminal, this whole aluminium cylinder is the cathode, negative terminal. Okay, next to understand is, see the central wire. The central wire is connected to the anode. So it is the positive terminal. The central wire is the positive terminal. The aluminium is the negative terminal. Okay. We also can see here helium, neon, or argon. 
these gases are inserted here with very low pressure and we know these gases are the inert gases inert gases i'm going to overrule your chemistry for a while in chemistry you might have learned these gases are stable stable neutral but what happened here listen to me carefully now let's see gamma enter the geiger muller tube gamma gamma ray is actually a high frequency wave electromagnetic wave as gamma enter the as gamma enter the geiger muller tube it will vibrate this helium neon and argon which are at low pressure because the frequency of gamma ray is very strong very high frequency as this helium neon and argon are vibrated they were vibrated so they will become ions temporary for temporary moment and these ions will start to discharge at aluminium and central wire so when the discharge occur a small pulse of current will start to flow so we are able to detect gamma radiation so i repeat again gamma with a very high frequency will enter the mica window of the geiger muller tube as it enter the whole area here will be ionized temporary for a temporary moment and as these ions are discharging back at the positive and negative terminal a small amount of current is produced all right this is how we are able to detect gamma okay next that's how we detect gamma next what will happen okay see here we realize that the aluminum is the negative cathode the central wire is the positive anode okay when beta started to enter beta entering the okay beta entering beta entering beta is positively charged all right beta will be easily deflected to the aluminum cylinder as beta deflected to the aluminum cylinder beta will be discharged at the aluminum cylinder because beta is eh, sorry sorry so i made a mistake beta will be discharged at the central wire not aluminum cylinder beta will be discharged at the central wire sorry mistake okay beta is negative so beta will be discharged at the central wire easily deflected and discharged at the central wire again a small amount of current will start to flow so every time these ions are formed and they are discharging current will flow a small pulse of current will flow so beta is negative discharge at the positive central wire the next thing will happen now all right so earlier was the alpha uh, gamma ray then beta now the alpha itself if alpha enter alpha will be straight discharge at the aluminum cylinder ah uh, alpha will be deflected and discharged at the aluminum cylinder so aluminum tube all right when alpha is discharged here a small current flows here because alpha is positive aluminum is negative small current will flow the rate meter with the help of transistor there's a transistor there with the help of transistor all right the rate meter with the help of transistor will count the amount of current produce all right and will increase it a bit and we are able to find the number of time the current flows through the rate meter based on the value of the number of time the current flows to the rate meter we are able to identify the readings we are able to identify what the readings all right so the rate meter readings the rate meter readings are based on how strong the radiation so what is the amount of current produced per second or per minute so we know from the radiation we have a count rate this is how geiger muller tube works okay okay when we look at 
the detectors to detect radiation beside the cloud chamber and the GM tube, the Geiger Muller tube, we also will have this simple photographic film. The film, if you see here carefully, see this is the film. The film will have color code, all right? This kind of photographic film. Normally, the doctors or the radiographer in the hospitals will be wearing this, all right? The nurses all, or maybe in a factory or lab when we are handling radioisotopes, all right? Based on the color on the surface, based on the color on the surface, they know that how much they were exposed to. So if it becomes darker, the color changes very obviously. They know they should not stay in that area very long or there was a leakage. So you go hospitals, when you have your uncle, aunties, anybody, your parents or doctor, you ask them, they'll tell you, right? They'll wear this and as the moment suddenly the color changes, they'll move from that area, right? The diagram I gave maybe a bit old model, now got new, new models, so okay. Recently I went to hospital, I saw they're wearing like a Ali Change skip a film all, okay. And um, it is good to identify, but normally this one, majority of the radiation can be detected by photographic film, normally will be alpha and beta. Gamma a bit difficult, alpha and beta, because this film so must be exposed to radiation and then really they change their color. So alpha, beta is the best option. Then we have the spark counter. So done. We are talking about um, spark chamber, Gagel Muller tube. Now we are at the yeah spark chamber, Gagel Muller tube. Now we are at the uh, photographic film. Now we go for spark counter. Spark counter. How does spark counter works? Okay, you see the diagram carefully. The spark counter works in a different system. Okay, it can only detect alpha, beta, all right, alpha and beta. Okay, you see here the metal net here, the wire here is connected to the cathode. And bottom, the metal or thin wire here connected to the positive terminal. Alpha is positive. Alpha is positive. Beta is negative. So as you bring the radioactive source here, all right, as the radiation enters, see this diagram, you're bringing radioactive source here, can you see, all right? So when you bring the radioactive source here on top of the spark counter, can you see there? The metal nets, you can see, this, you see these are the metal nets there, okay? So when you bring the radioisotope there, what happened here is that, you realize as they move through here, alpha will be, discharged by the surface negative terminal. Alpha will be discharged by the surface negative terminal. And if it is not discharged, it will be reflected by the positive terminal at the bottom. Beta will be reflected by the negative terminal. Beta will be reflected back. If it's able to enter through, it will be discharged at the bottom, All right? So this is basically discharging me mechanism of alpha and beta and they will produce a kind of sound as they discharge, right? So based on the sound and the, a bit reading here, we know what is the radiation, right? So this is how we use spark counter, spark counter. Okay, so we have looked at cloud chamber, GM tube, um, photographic film, spark counter. Okay, we also look at other system with, uh, there are something else also at the last page I give you all. Okay. See here, we also can detect with a basic dosimeter. This one, you can even uh, get it in Lazada. Okay, this dosimeter can show you a bit of radiation level. And also we can use a gamma spectroscopy. Okay, normally high tech area, what they will do if let's say the earth, okay, for example, you have a huge jungle, you clear the jungle and you are not sure what is the minerals under the ground. Let's say you want to make road or you want to make development, you clear jungle areas, sorts like that. What they will do normally, the four-wheel drive that goes to off-road, as they come out most of the time, where they will detect the uh, radiation from the tire, all right? It's a radiation upper identifier. Normally, you can detect gamma. So logically, you see, you clear 
one jungle area. Then you drive through that area a few times and you come and detect your tire. Your tire shows there is an exposure of radiation of gamma ray. So now you know that means the area of jungle that you have cleared earlier might be having quite a number of radiations. All right. You can outsource and find what was the minimum. Every radioactive substance, every radioactive substance, all right, they will go through a decay process. As they go through a decay process, what happens? The initial amount after a certain time frame will decrease to half from the initial amount. For example, if I'm having iodine 131, right? with a half-life of, let's say, eight days. Eight days, right? Let's say today I'm having in the quantity of liquid or solid, let's say liquid, right? I done one to one, today I'm having a, an amount of 200 ml or 200 gram or 200 cm cube, okay? Due to the half-life of I done one to one, which is one, eight days, I would done one to one having half life of eight days, all right? So after the first half life time frame, which is eight days, all right, which is eight days, we realize that the remaining balance from the initial amount is only 100 gram. So if I follow another half life, the remaining balance will be only 50 gram from the initial amount. So what is half-life? What is half-life? So let's look at it, okay? Half-life, what I did now? Okay, half-life should be, all right, defined as the time taken, the time taken for half of the atoms to decay. So when the half of the atoms decay, not um, the molecules, not the elements, the half of the atoms decay. So we will realize the count can be used, the count rate ma method can be used, or the mass can be used, or the fraction can be used, or the percentage. Okay, I'll show you one by one. Huh? Okay, remember NO stands for the... Uh, Initial amount, initial amount, N starts for, the capital N starts for remaining balance and the small N starts for, uh, shows how many times half-life of third. This is the formula between them, okay. There's another formula to show, the formula is, so there are actually two formulas, okay. See here, another formula will be, another formula will be total time taken. Total time taken. Total time taken should be equal to number of time half-life of third times the time of half-life. Number of time half-life of third times the time of half-life. All right. So these are the formulas. These are the two formulas. Okay. Let's look at it. Yeah. See here. Okay. I give you idea, first idea. When you talk about half-life, the first idea here, we go by percentage. So always remember the initial amount is counted as percentage, all right? So this is the initial amount, original amount. So after the first time of half-life, all right? After the first time of half-life, the remaining balance will be 50% from the initial amount. So the first idea is percentage. And after another half-life time frame, the half-life time, let's say for this substance example, I gave you the half-life is let's say two days. So this is the first two days. The second two days, the remaining balance is 25%. Things to look at here, amount, decayed here, amount decayed is 75%. The 75% gone already. What is the remaining balance? 
the remaining balance is actually 25%. So, first idea of half-life, half-life the time taken for the initial amount to decrease by half. So, first idea we use the concept of percentage. We use the concept of what? Percentage. Percentage. Now, the second concept. The second concept, we use the concept of mass. Mass. Right? Let's say for an example, you were given initial amount, initial amount of a radioactive or radioisotope, uh, 800 gram. This is the initial amount, 800 gram. All right? We're given initial amount, 800 gram. And let's say the half-life of this substance is a perfect, let's say, 10 minutes. Okay. So after the first half-life, right, which is 10 minutes, right, the remaining balance will be perfectly 400 gram. Gone already, 800 become 400 gram. All right. Then after another half-life, right, which is again 10 minutes, which is again 10 minutes, all right, the remaining balance will be 200 gram. 200 gram. So what are we having here? We are having here, all right, a total time, a total time of 20 minutes. A total time of 20 minutes. How many times half-life occurred? Twice. So we can see here the total time for this decay is 20 minutes. And the number of time half-life occurred is twice, two times. So this is how we look at half-life. Okay, so first example, we're looking at percentage. Now second example, we're looking at the mass. Let's go for the third example. The third example, we will look at fraction, by fraction, okay? Always remember the initial amount will be taken as one, one. So after the first half-life time frame, the remaining balance will be half from the first initial amount. After another time frame of half-life, Excuse me, the remaining balance will be half from the, from the initial amount. So if it is half, you times again half. So you get 1 over 4. After the same equal half-life time frame, you have to times the balance with another half. You will get 1 over 8. So... If I say each half-life here is equivalent to 100 seconds. So what was the total time taken here? Total time taken here should be 300 seconds. How many times half-life occurred? Three times. You see, one, two, three. What is the remaining balance? One over eight. So... This is the method of fraction. So we can use method of fraction for half-life, method of mass for half-life, or method of percentage. We have the next one, the last one. We also can use the method of count rate. Okay, so let's say per time frame. Let's say per minute. The count rate. Huh? So very easy. Let's say initial count rate was 4,000 count per minute. So, after the first half-life time frame, the remaining balance will be 2,000 from the initial amount. After another half-life frame, the remaining balance will be half from the 2,000, 1,000. After another half-life frame, half-life time, the remaining balance will be 500 from the 1,000. So this is how we look at count rate per minute. So every time we have the idea to look at 
half-life, we see the initial amount. This is the initial amount. From this initial amount, after the time of half-life, it becomes half from the initial amount. Initial is 4,000, half from it. Then we get 2,000. Half from 2,000, after another same time of half-life, we get 1,000 and it goes on. Clear? Okay, this is how we look at half-life, concept of half-life. So there are four types of equations you'll check. Count rate per minute, fraction, mass, and percentage. Clear? Excuse me. Okay, first here. A radioactive substance takes 168 seconds to its activations to decrease from 960 to 120 per minute. What is the half-life of this substance? Very easy. We do the method without using the formula, okay? 960 count per minute after the first half-life time frame will drop to 480 count per minute. All right? Then the same time frame of half-life, the 480 will drop to 240 count per minute. After the same another half-life time frame, the 240 will drop to 120. So the question says initial amount 960, remaining amount 120. So correct. Huh? Initial amount 960, remaining amount 120. So we have reached this. So how many times half-life occurred? from 960 to 120. We realize the half-life occurred three times. The half-life occurred three times. So when the half-life occurred three times, to find the time of half-life, we can take the formula of the total time given divide by the number of times the half-life occurred. The total time given divided by the number of times the half-life occurred. So the total time given here was 168 seconds and the half-life occurred three times. So what's your answer guys? 56 seconds. Correct? Correct. Thank you. Okay, Janani, your microphone not working today. Huh? Okay, now, number two, a sample iodine-131 found to have activity of 800 counts per second. Okay, 800 counts per second. What will be the number of activation of this sample? Okay, what will be the number of activation of this sample after 16 days? You know the... Half-life is eight days. Do you know the half-life is eight days? Try to figure out. If half-life is eight days, total time given is 16 days, all right? Can you tell me how many half-life occurred in between now? So, two half-life occurred in between. Why? In 16 days, each half-life is 8 days. So, two half-life occurred. If two half-life occurred, what will be the number of activation of this sample? So, initial amount was 800 count per second. Half-life occurred only twice, only two times. After the first half-life, the remaining balance is 400. Then, the half-life occurred again. The remaining balance is only 200. Because half-life only occurred twice. So what will be the number of activation? So the number of activation after 16 days should be only 200 count per second. That's the answer. 200 count per second. That's the answer. All right. Okay. The third one. And you couldn't do right just now. This is the one, right? Phosphorus 32 has a half-life of 15 days. 
excuse me, phosphorus that has half life of 15 days, how long it will take for 75% of its substance to decay? So see here carefully, yeah? initial amount should be 100%. All right. So after the first half life, the remaining balance must be 50%. So now let's start thinking. Uh, let's, let's think. Remaining balance 50%. So 50% gone. The loss is 50%. The balance is 50%. Now from this 50%, after another half life, remaining balance is 25%. It's 25%. All right. So what happened now? Okay. We realized that the amount loss should be. 75%, the balance is 25%. Clear, guys? Clear? So how long is it? it does it take? 30 days. It took a time of 30 days. Any question, anyone? Yeah. Any question? Yeah. Can you repeat number two again? Because Six. Okay, look at question number four, right? If half life, okay, if half life of a radioactive substance A is 10 days, what is the percentage of substance from the initial quantity has decayed after 30 days? So what is the leftover? See here carefully. So number of time half life occurred should be the total time of 30 days over. Each half-life is 10 days. So, half-life occurred three times. Three times. So, since they want to know the balance of the percentage, so we do the percentage mechanism. Okay, so we take the initial amount as 100%. 100%. After the first half-life, the remaining balance will be 50% from the initial amount. After another half-life, the remaining balance will be 25% from the initial amount. And after another half-life, because half-life occurred three times, huh? the remaining balance will be 12.5% from the initial amount. So, three times it occurs. Occurred, huh? One, two, the third time. So, we have covered the time frame of 30 days. So, there are two parts here. What is the percentage of substance from the initial quantity have decayed? So, the amount that have decayed The amount decayed should be 100 minus 12.5. When you 100 minus 12.5, you'll get 87.5%. And what is the balance? The balance amount, the left amount, okay, should be the 12.5%. Okay, this is how we calculate number four. Number five, very easy. A radioactive substance has a half-life of 20 minutes. What is the fraction of amount left from initial amount after one hour? What is the fraction of amount left from initial amount after one hour? So number of time half-life occurred. One hour is equivalent to 60 minutes. Each half-life is 20 minutes. So we realize half-life occurred three times. Three times half-life has taken place. So, what is the fraction of amount left? So, we take the initial amount as one. After the first half-life time, the remaining balance is half. Another half-life time, the remaining balance is half from the half, one over four. So, one over two times one over two. Then, after another half-life, the one over four must times one over two. You get one over Eight. So this is the answer. What is the answer, guys? The answer is 1 over 8. 1 over 8, all right? So what is the fraction of amount left from the initial amount? It's 1 over 8. Lah. Okay, next. 
A fossil bond shows activations of one over four from initial amount. So now they are trying to tell you the left balance is one over four. So before that, as we see here, it should have been one over two. Before that, if you, should, if you see here, it should have been one. So number of half-life, it occurred twice. Twice. So what are you looking for? You're looking for age of the bone. So you're looking for total time. So total time should be, total time should be the number of time the half-life occurred times the time of half-life. The number of time half-life occurred times the time of half-life, you get the total time. So half-life occurred twice. Each half-life took five, seven, three, zero years. Five, seven, three, zero years. So the age of the bone, the age of the bone should be 11, four, six, zero years. 11,000. 460 years, right? That should be the answer.